This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles by Leslie Heron. Chapter 25, Cyprus. You're late. Vel looked up, squinting through the darkness of the alleyway to see Matthew standing impatiently before a stack of boxes. By only a few minutes, the mob forced me to double back more than once. He shrugged the heavy pack off his shoulder, stretching his sore muscles. Matthew tucked his pocket watch away and looked back up at the cyborg. And you didn't let any of those rolling tin cans see you, right? Vel ran his mechanical hand through his hair. He had seen three large metal robots patrolling the gates to the college. He shouldn't have been surprised that the High Inquisitor had succeeded, really. His own brother was determined to a fault, and nothing would stand in the way of completing a task. It only made sense that Elias would display a similar resolve. Vel shook away these thoughts and returned his focus to the man standing before him. I don't think so. Or at least they made no notice of me. Matthew's face pulled into a sour scowl. Let's hope not. He looked down at the pack at the cyborg's feet. You and that thing better be ready. He straightened the collar of his shirt and started off down the alley. Vel watched the other man disappear into the crowd at the end of the street. He could track Matthew's progress by the line of irritated citizens being jostled out of the way, until finally Vel could see him break the front lines of the protesters and walk right up to one of the patrolling robots. The crest of his hair barely reached the middle of the machine's chest. Out of the way, you tarnished piece of garbage! I want a word with the Inquisitor! A hush fell over the immediate crowd as they waited to see what happened next. They watched with bated breath as the copper sentry swiveled its head in the direction of the voice that had spoken. Please stand back. You are not authorized beyond this point. The cold, emotionless voice sent a shiver up Vel's spine. But Matthew held tight to his resolve, and he looked down at the menacing hand held out before him, with its thick coils ending in a clamped fist. He puffed out his chest and squared his jaw, meeting the gaze of those cold, beady black eyes. Oh yeah? What are you gonna do about it? He made a dramatic sweep of his hand, a broad gesture to those around him, as if to say, you can't stop us all. And then he took a heavy step past the robot. A deafening blast of gunpowder rang out through the silence of the crowd. Matthew stumbled, one hand wrapped around the metal bars of the iron gate, the other clutching at his chest. He turned to face the mob, still stunned by his actions, and pulled his hand away to reveal a red stain spreading rapidly across the front of his crisp white shirt. He stumbled once more and collapsed to the ground. He reached for the sky with a feeble gesture and breathed out his last words. Down with the Inquisitor. His hands fell limp to the ground as his head lolled to the side. Vel rolled his eyes as he massaged his temples. Here's open the kids overacting, then it ruined the plan. The spectacle had been constructed with the help of a flashbang attached to Matthew's boot and a small bladder of wine hidden in his shirt pocket. Add a little dramatic acting, and they had the perfect spark to spur a mob into a frenzy. Vel wrapped his fingers around the sling of the bag as he watched the horde of angry citizens surge forward. A palpable rage ripped down the alley as angry voices melded together to avenge their fallen compatriot. They were so hell-bent on revenge that they didn't even notice Matthew scramble out of the way in order to not be trampled. Even the guards were taken aback by the mob, floundering in the wake of the deluge of angry cries. Distraction established, Vel hoisted the bag over his shoulder and began scaling the stack of crates. The plan was to make it into the college through a side entrance and create another diversion with the guards there, splitting their resources and pulling them away from certain areas of the college. Once on the last box, he jumped and his mechanical hand found purchase on the stone ledge. He peered up and down the length of the wall, squinting for any sign of red before throwing his legs over and landing neatly on the other side. He frowned a little as he glanced about. 
The map Atticus had scribbled from memory described his landing point as an old storage area. But the blades of grass that crunched beneath his boots and the strong, sweet smell of apple blossoms told him he was in the wrong place. Vel cursed as he tucked behind a large stone statue of a venerable-looking man, wielding a wrench and a book. From his first glance, it appeared that he had landed in some sort of courtyard or campus retreat. Between a grove of trees was a massive bubbling fountain, several benches, and a winding gravel path. He looked around, checking that the coast was clear, before stepping onto the trimmed walkway. The path circled the water fountain and led back to a small, unassuming door tucked against a massive brick wall of the college. Amy, where the hell am I? I am unfamiliar with this area. Vel stopped, sliding the pack off his back. He began rummaging around for the map, careful not to disturb the tea kettle. Why didn't you make a scan of the area last time we were here? His fingers wrapped around a folded section of paper. I cannot map areas that are outside of your visual range. Of course not. Vel was about to chide his computer for the snark response when the door to the college opened. With no time to hide, he froze, hand still clutched around the paper. Holt, you are unauthorized to be in this area. Vel slowly turned, raising his hands as he came face to sternum with a blackened copper chest of a Berg replica. The robot's eyes flickered in quick succession as a small antenna array on its shoulder began to swivel. Unknown hostile detected in northeastern quadrant. Vel considered running, but was distracted by the bag at his feet, which started giving off the sound of rapid hissing. Admittedly, this had not been how Chester had imagined his first experience in the glittering floating city. With the little coin, they had managed to bypass most of the increased security around the school and descended into the wealthy streets of Avis, without so much as a second glance. Now, despite strolling among the citizens of Avis Isle as though they belonged, Atticus had insisted they were on a tight schedule and that there was no time to stop and sightsee. Atticus, are you sure we don't have even a moment to spare? I'd really like to visit some of these shops. Chester slowed, licking his lips hungrily as his eyes fell across the window display full of golden jewelry. The glittering diamonds in the window alone could feed his army of children for six months. Atticus turned and tugged against Chester's shirt sleeve. No, come on. If we miss our window, we might not be able to get inside the workshop. Chester could tell that Atticus was in a panicked state. He sighed and fell in line beside the boy. You know you don't have to do this, right? Atticus shook his head, climbing a cobblestone ramp that led up to the Inquisitor's estate. He had made it this far and wasn't about to give up. I have to. Chester tugged against the boy's shoulder, pulling him to a stop. It's going to be dangerous, and I understand that you are far more clever than I, but I assure you I can dismantle a few robots with ease. He pulled his hands away and moved them up to the boy's hat, adjusting it slightly. You can return to the library and let me handle the rest. No one would think you were a coward. They wouldn't even have to know. Atticus swatted away the fatherly gesture. You don't get it, do you? He turned and continued up the ramp, fishing around in his vest pocket for the silver key. I have to do this. It's not about being brave or stopping the Inquisitor. My best friend is in there, so it doesn't matter if it's dangerous. I need to save him. Chester pulled the silver key from his own pockets and handed it over to the boy. You know you're not going to find your friend in there, right? He's gone. Atticus gave a solemn nod as he took the key, the elevator now within sight. Of course I know that, but it doesn't matter. He's my family, and I can't leave him in there. It's scary being all alone. Jester sighed around his grit teeth. You have always been like a son to me, and I say this with the most amount of love I can. But right now, you're being stupid. Please, reconsider? Atticus pushed the key into the brass panel next to the glass doors. Sometimes, 
People do stupid things for their family. Chester's shoulders slumped. Don't I know it. He tucked his hands into his pockets, ready to step through onto the gilded platform, when the ground beneath their feet gave a mighty tremble. He, along with everyone else in the area, stumbled slightly. He met eyes with the boy and nodded. Appears our timetable has just moved up. Alphonse adjusted his coat, dusting off the shoulders as he did. He straightened his back when the sound of hurried footsteps caught his attention. A squad of soldiers rounded the corner, and he held up his hand, causing them to skid to a stop. And just where do you lot think you're headed? A boy, barely old enough to shave, opened his mouth in what was sure to be a jeering response. But he took one look at the stripes on the other man's shoulder and snapped a salute. Report to the main gates, sir! The truth was, the coat had belonged to his father, a lieutenant colonel in his time, who had needlessly died in a skirmish after the High Inquisitor had chosen to place a new embargo on one of their neighboring countries. Al knew he was being sentimental, that he could have just liberated a spare from the laundry cupboard, but when his mother had offered it to him for this mission, he felt a little sentimentality might be necessary. He was certain his father would have approved of this little act of insubordination. Al twisted his face into a condescending sneer. To main gates? Can't you follow orders? You're supposed to report to the Western Grounds. The soldier blinked a few times in confusion. But they're attacking the front gates, sir. They've almost broken through. Al threw his hands up in exasperation. <sighs> An obvious diversion tactic. The Western Wall is our weakest point, and intel says that rebel forces will be breaking through any minute now. The soldier faltered for a moment, his mouth opening and closing like a fish out of water. The information slowly absorbed into his brain, and he spun on the other soldiers behind him. Well, what are you waiting for? You heard the lieutenant colonel? The group of men marched back down the hall they had entered from, disappearing around the corner. Al couldn't help the smile that spread across his face. He had been sending soldier after soldier all across the campus of the school, misleading them with false information and imaginary breakpoints. Some were sent to gather the staff and students, others to keep the council up on the veranda and out of the way. He'd even convinced one particularly perplexed group to go down and patrol the waterways beneath the college in case any enemy ships arrived. He was rather proud of that one. A surge of confidence pumped through his veins as he rounded the corner opposite of the exiting troops. He moved towards a door to one of the main campus courtyards where he was sure to run across more soldiers. He was already planning his next diversion to keep the upper floors clear for Atticus and Chester. What he wasn't expecting was the rush of hot air that exploded the door off its hinges, sending it flying directly towards him. It knocked him flat against the floor and pushed him back a few yards, skidding across the slick surface on his backside. When the building stopped shaking and silence fell across the hallway, Al scrambled to his feet. At the end of the hall, where a small plain door once stood, was now a massive hole. The second floor was in danger of collapsing into the first as thirty feet of wall and brick had been reduced to rubble. A cloud of hot white steam was issuing from the middle of the pile. It mixed with the dust in the air to create a muddy fog, impairing his vision beyond a few feet. But through the haze, Al could make out, half crushed by a section of support beams, the remnants of a Berg replica and that damned tea kettle. It was still sputtering out jets of superheated steam in one last act of defiance. A groan at the edge of the destruction pulled Al's attention away. He squinted through the dust to see a glint of a mechanical arm reaching out through the debris. He clambered atop the rubble, shifting bricks and wood as he shouted, Oi! Are you alive in there, mate? Vel grunted as he managed to work his hand around the edge of a piece of scaffolding and pushed it away from his chest. A cascade of rock and dust fell through the gap where he looked up to see the concerned, ashen face of Alphonse. He took in a wheezing breath as he tried to stand. I've been better. Al seized the cyborg's forearm and helped him up out of the gap in the pile. You're early and in the wrong spot. What happened? Vel scrubbed at his scalp with both hands, removing the dust and gravel from his hair. 
he looked around for a moment, coughing a little as he did. He pointed down to the set of mangled treads near his feet. One of the bots surprised me, and then that stupid tea kettle just went off all on its own. He gave an overdramatic gesture at his surroundings. Al's ears turned a shade of pink. Oh, same thing happened to Berg once. Nearly took his head clean off. He reached out and dusted off the cyborg's shoulders. Atticus called it radio frequency interference, or something like that. Vel slapped away Al's hands. Thanks for warning me. Yeah, but there's a bigger problem now. That tea kettle was supposed to be our exit strategy. Now what do we do? Several half-uniformed soldiers rounded a different corner, skidding to a halt at the sight of Al's stripes. They snapped into a salute, but couldn't help their curiosity from peeking. We heard an explosion, sir. Is everything all right? Al cleared his throat as he marched forward to address the boys. Why aren't you lot dressed and heading to the evacuation point? This isn't a time for slacking. Sorry, sir. We just got out of class. What evacuation point? There's a bleeding riot going on, and you're off learning your ABCs. Get your gear in order and have your squad round up any and all remaining staff and report to the Western dormitories. Al couldn't keep the beads of sweat from forming on his forehead. This had been the most lying he'd done since his mother had bumped into him chatting up a working girl in the no-guard district. The soldier caught a shift of movement in the hazy cloud and leaned forward to get a better look at Vel. Who is that? Oh, I see. So you think I earned these? Al jabbed at his father's stripes with a finger, moving within an inch of the man's face. Just to have my subordinates ignore a direct order. The soldier paled at the fury of his commanding officer and leaned away. D -d -d no sir! Then get to it! Al thrust his hand in the direction of the hall the boys had come from, and before he could even add to his threat, they were gone. Vel clamped a hand on Al's shoulder. Good work. Let's get out of here, though. They can't be the only ones that heard that. Al nodded. Eh, except you don't look like you belong here. Take this. He began undoing the silver fastens of the coat before sliding it off his shoulders. Vel reached out, but in a moment of hesitation pulled his hand away. I, uh, I really don't have a good track record when it comes to coats. Al laughed. Oi, <laughs> in order to be expecting that one to be returned without even a thread loose. Vel took the jacket with reluctance. What about you? Al waved him off. We just sent a group of half-dressed cadets into imaginary battle. I'm sure I can blend in. A smile broke across his freckled face. Vel nodded and looked down, running his fingers across the stripes on the sleeve. I know what this means to you. He glanced back up. I'll take good care of it. The smile fell from Al's face. Just stop the bastard, whatever it takes. Chester ran his hand along the brass-plated lever box as the glass doors slid open, unable to fight the grin spreading across his face. I wonder what it would cost to have one of these installed in the library. Atticus paused, turning to look up at the interior before he stepped out. Where would it go? The library is nowhere near the aviary district. He peered up and down the hallway, gathering a mental map of the floor before marching off in the direction he was sure was the warehouse. Chester shrugged as he fell in line beside the kid. As long as I could enjoy that view whenever I wanted, it could stop halfway up for all I care. Atticus grinned at the idea of an elevator that led to nowhere. Well, if you get made the materials, I could probably... Chester caught the echoing sound of heavy footfalls and grabbed Atticus, pushing him inside a darkened classroom. He convinced the door shut with the heel of his boot and kept his face trained on the boy. He pushed a finger to his own lips, urging him to remain quiet. From the sound of it, troops were ushering out a large group of unwilling professors explaining to them that all personnel must proceed to a so-called evacuation point, regardless of their irritation level. Once the silence in the hall returned, Chester cracked open the door to check if they were safe to leave. He stiffened as the shadow of both of the Inquisitor's guards fell across the door. 
They paused for a moment before continuing on down the corridor, keeping in line with the evacuating group. A sigh of relief escaped Chester's pursed lips. Coast is clear. Do you know which way to go? Atticus nodded and led them from the room. He turned down a long, empty hall, looking about as if to gather his bearings. They clung to the walls, ready to duck into a nearby classroom should another group of soldiers arrive, but none came. They were alone in the darkened corridors of this floor of the university. Atticus stopped in front of the set of large metal doors that he and Vel had marched through so proudly not but a week earlier. His hands trembled as he reached out, fear overtaking him at what he might find inside. He pushed against the metal doors, and they didn't budge. Frowning, he leaned against them harder this time. Still nothing. Atticus turned, his face falling as he did. They're locked. That never-ceasing smile only widened on Chester's face. Allow me. He stepped forward, nudging the boy aside as he reached into a pocket of his vest. He pulled out the small, ornately crafted mechanical spider. He lifted the beast to the keyhole and prodded it into action. The dainty creature twitched for a moment, its little head swiveling left then right, before it stuck out one of its many legs. It began to explore the inner workings of the lock, lifting and lowering its leg until a resounding click echoed through the door. The spider pulled away and sat back in the middle of Chester's palm. Atticus's brow shot up, disappearing into his hat. He leaned over, squinting at the tiny golden bug. I didn't know it could do that. If a mechanical spider could look smug, this one was doing a great impression of it. Chester chuckled as he pocketed the creature once more. Oh, I did. That's why I had you procure it for me. He pushed against the metal doors, and they swung open without argument. As the two stepped into the room, they were engulfed by darkness, broken in spots by flickering flood lamps. Many had been toppled in the aftermath of the students' forced evacuation. Long shadows stretched out from beneath the dozens of still and lifeless metal forms that lined the length of the warehouse. Empty bodies that eagerly awaited the touch of artificial life. Life that had been stolen from another. Atticus approached the table that still held the remains of Berg. A flood of horror washed over him as his eyes fell across a tangle of wires and coils that extended out from the brass chassis that made up his friend's chest cavity. The long cables were connected to the gearbox of the portal machine. Atticus blinked away the sparkle of tears in his eyes as he swallowed down the bile rising in his throat. His teacher had torn his friend apart, reverse-engineering everything that made him unique and reduced him to a glorified calculator. He steadied himself with a slow intake of breath. It's okay, buddy. I'm here now. Chester placed a hand on the boy's shoulder. He didn't quite understand the bond those two shared, but he respected it nonetheless. Berg would be happy that you came back for him, but let's honor his memory by first putting a stop to these things and your teacher. Atticus nodded, pulling his hand away from the cold metal. He turned to face the nearest robot, glaring up into its cold, dead eyes with an unknown fury that was new to him. There's only one Berg. Sir. It would appear as if the riots have hit a breaking point. Elias didn't need the information tragedy had just relayed to him. He was standing in the foyer of his college, watching guards scramble around him to barricade the doors. He had his hands tucked in his pockets as he observed the chaos unfolding before him. Citizens were railing against the front gates, chanting and shouting. It wouldn't be long before they broke through, and fires were sure to follow. Comedy stepped forward, lowering her head a little as she spoke. Sir, the gates are being held by your mechanical forces, but we don't know for how long. We should get you out of here before that happens. Elias sighed, keeping his eyes trained on the guards that continued to spill out from behind him, adding chairs, desks, and anything else they could find to the barricade. What about our reserves? Tragedy looked behind him 
down the empty hall. The majority have been ordered to the Western Wall, and many others are currently unaccounted for. Elias turned on his heel. Then order them back here, now! Each word was forced from his throat as he was unable to curb the rage boiling from within. We've tried, sir. Comedy kept her gaze on the ground. They won't abandon the personnel, and they said that the bulk of the attack was to happen at that wall. She looked up at the cold fury raging in the Inquisitor's eyes. Even the council is evacuating, sir. Elias could feel a muscle tense in his face with every hammering sound of rebellion against his metal machines. He slammed his hand against the wall, feeling it crack beneath his knuckles. He remained this way for several long moments as he coerced his breathing to a normal rhythm. Elias pulled his hand away and tucked it behind him, ignoring the blood seeping between his fingers. Then I shall order them personally. He spun and began stalking down one of the halls that would lead him to the western end of the college. If I may, sir. Tragedy fell in line, placing himself between his twin and the Inquisitor as they walked. The riots will not disperse without the right motivation to do so. What are you implying? Show the citizens that you will not remain tolerant to their acts of disobedience. Give them a display of dominance. One that will make them reassess their little rebellion. Elias pulled away, almost recoiling at the thought. Are you suggesting that I authorize lethal force on my own citizens? Comedy piped up from somewhere behind them. Sir, would that not simply reinforce what the people already believe? It would only serve to embolden and strengthen their cause. You would just be confirming their beliefs. An unseen sneer curled at tragedy's features. If they didn't already believe him to be a tyrant, they wouldn't be breaking down our doors. He kept his gaze steadied at the Inquisitor. If we don't stop this now, they will storm through the university and destroy everything you have worked for. Elias slowed to a stop, the options warring within his mind. He studied the blank floor before him for a long moment. One act of aggression to buy us enough time. He chewed on his words, mulling them over before adding, We will activate the remainder of the robots, but the lives lost now will save more in the future. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. The trio looked up at the source of the chiding mockery. Vel was leaning against the wall at the end of the corridor, shaking his head with a disapproving stare. Elias's brow furrowed as he felt the realization crash into him. All of this was you? A smug smile broke over Vel's features. Brick by brick, remember? Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles is book two of the ongoing Psy Fantasy series by author Leslie Heron. Join us as the adventure unfolds, with new chapters releasing every few weeks. Oh, sorrow! I am but a lad in the prime of my life, cut down by the cruelty of an oppressive ruler. Um, Matthew... How cruel is the hand of fate! Oh, he's not done. For I shall know not another summer, or true love's kiss. Goodbye, my people. Remember my sacrifice. <sighs> right. Um, Matthew, do you really feel this speech is necessary? Normally, people don't take that long to die, nor do they do so with so much poetry. You said we needed to stir the emotions of the crowd. That's what I'm doing. Far be it from me to criticize a thespian of such renown as yourself— but we are going for realism here. They must believe it. Are you saying that wasn't believable? I bid my soul on that stage. And a marvellous job you did, too. But could you bear it a little faster? And with less talking? Everyone's a critic.